Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Now, at the beginning of my video today, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about here is pretty speculative at best. I've just been trying to formulate some ideas about how this La Nina might possibly influence the upcoming uh, winter and then spring and next summer, because I'm getting asked a lot of questions about it. And uh, I just went looking for analogs as, as a metric. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at current sea surface temperatures. And uh, you know that we've been talking a lot lately about how um, we still have strong trade winds. Southern Oscillation Index is about a 10 or 11. Got plenty of cold water underneath here to kind of surface. We're even quite cold all the way over to Nina region 1 and 2. A unique thing about this compared to a year ago is that we do have cold water also extending from Hawaii to California. And there's a very deep reservoir of cold water now that's showing up in the Gulf of Alaska, where we have for the last about a month seen really deep troughs of low pressure developing there. So that, that's an interesting consequence. Now, when the models were initiated with this pattern, they're going to continue it. They're going to take the sea surface temperatures and allow that pattern to perpetuate. Uh, and it's going to be influential on the upcoming forecast. And so I'm thinking a lot about that because last year's La Nina did not feature this in October. Wasn't there. These features were not there. So we know that the forecast for this La Nina, take a look here at the top. This is a three month sliding window from the European model. We see as we go into the beginning of winter, middle of winter, end of winter, and beginning of spring, that the La Nina fades, all right? We still have quite a bit of warm water here, but we've maintained this kind of reverse C shape of cold water there, and we're still in that positive phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. Now, this is what had me intrigued right here with the fading La Nina by February, March, and April of next year. And when I went thinking about that, I, I pulled up the graphic again just to see if this was consistent with all the ensemble members. And we looked at this a while ago, and sure enough, peaks somewhere around December, January, and then um, fades into March. So given that, I went looking for some analogs, and I landed on 2008. Because by uh, November, mid-November, about a month from now, but back in 2008, we'd seen the cold water here extending there. And this La Nina was developing at this particular point. Now, it doesn't look exactly the same, but at least the cold water extended back over here towards South America. We could argue that this year's La Nina is already stronger than 2008. So the progression of that through winter into spring, this is now April 1st, that cooler water stayed in place here with the large warm tongue pushing into it. And we were fading away this La Nina by April. Very similar, I think, to what we're looking at here. All right. So as I was watching this, uh, whoops, sorry, sorry, let's go back here. Uh, I wanted to know, well, from April, which is what you're seeing now, to July, how do things progress? That colder water kind of stayed in place, but we developed an El Nino by the time we got into the middle of summer of 2009. So we transitioned out of La Nina into El Nino, maintained a cooler bias here along the west coast of, of North America. And now I want to show you what happened. Now, please, I'm using one year as an analog. That's it. But I'm just formulating these ideas. So let's talk about it. This is what we had for that winter, December 2008 to February 2009. This is very La Nina-like, okay? Cooler conditions here, warmer to the south, warmer in the southeast. That's exactly what you'd expect with a La Nina. What did the precipitation do? Well, you can match up the colors here. We were dry in Texas and dry in the southeast, to be honest. If you would have added a dry California to that, that'd be very typical of La Nina. While we had an active Ohio River Valley storm track and more snow in the northern tier of the U.S., uh, but the only thing that's not La Nina-like about this is that normally the Pacific Northwest has more snow than normal. But we were watching a transition here. That was winter. And then as we got into summer, now this was really interesting. Remember summer 2009? Broad area that across the United States was cooler than the climatological average. And when you look at the precip patterns, we were wet in the midsection of the country and wet into the Northeast. And unfortunately, there was drought development in the Southeast and close to the south down here and parts of the southwest with monsoon never really got going. All I want to do is throughout the next several weeks and months, we're going to continue to build this picture. And I just wanted to put something in the back of your mind here that I'm looking at. Yes, it is a single analog year, but I'm, I'm watching it carefully. Now, from there, why don't we get to what we've seen lately? And let's talk about precipitation. This has been 
something that's really bothered me about the forecast. Because going back to September, or before even September, back into August and, and through the month of September, we were looking out for this harvest time period. And we knew that we had a chance at seeing above normal precipitation in the midsection of the country. But I stated multiple times that it was not going to be one of those years where we just had the stuck front like this, or sometimes it orients like that. doesn't matter. No stationary front. What it was going to be was low pressure systems rolling through. But by no means did I tell you that the month-to-date precipitation stats in October were going to look this wet for the northern plains or even through the midsection of the Corn Belt here, especially in parts of the southeast and now down in the southern plains. I mean, that's a very large area that's been wetter than normal, and we just added a lot to that. I mean, take a look at the last 72 hours. The precipitation we see here was partly driven by flow around a big high-pressure cell. It was driven by the remnants of a hurricane in Pamela that came through. And then that cold front, which sliced through this section of the southern and high plains, producing numerous reports of severe weather. And I'm still baffled by some of the behavior along this line of storms that came through, like Kansas. Uh, had very interesting radar signatures, uh, and, and I'm just fascinated to look at it. But the end result is we put down a lot of precipitation so far, and a lot of this still has to go somewhere, and it's going to continue to go here. While we will dry out on the backside of this, and I think the southeast is going to stay relatively dry as well, we're going to shut those harvest windows down once again over here in parts of the eastern Corn Belt. And this is not good. There's a lot of folks over here that, uh, of course, plant some winter wheat after they get the beans out, and all this extra rain is going to be causing problems with that. Now, we're talking problems, but I, I think there might be a, a good thing about this recent system. And that is, look at all the snow that was put here into parts of the, this part of the Rockies, and here in Wyoming, and, and also into Montana. Uh, this is the last 72 hours worth of total snowfall. And this is all going to melt, okay? Not the stuff in the mountains, but this is going to melt. And it's going to melt slowly, and the good news is, that's an area, as we look at our latest drought monitor, that's still very much struggling with drought. Now, these only have data, this map, excuse me, only has data in it through October the 12th. So I'm, I'm hoping to see some improvement in that particular area. And when I look down just to kind of see what the soy moisture looks like, you know, there are places in through here where we were in deficit, down to about 40 inches, about 100 centimeters. But th this is good to just continue to improve that overall drought you know, problem area that we've had in through here. Now, this again is pretty deep down. Let's get a little shallower here and let's just go down four inches. And you can see the effect of where we still have flood watches in this area and all that additional precipitation in the Northern Plains. It's great for the longer term. It's great, but it's terrible for what we're attempting to get out of the fields right now. So we got to just weigh the, I guess, the good with the bad in that particular case. Now, this is going to be an area that's going to see some improvement in soil moisture. But as I said, it's going to come at the expense of knocking us out of the fields for harvest here. And this is going to be important, again, for those folks that are going to do uh, plant a winter wheat crop that follows this. So where do we stand with the winds? Well, here is now where that deep low pressure system that came out of Wyoming has ended up. And as it did so, of course, we saw very strong synoptic scale winds, even a blizzard warning that showed up in Wyoming. And now what we're dealing with today is the flow doing something like this coming around a high pressure cell here. And that's going to push most of this over into the Ohio Valley. And that's where we do have the risk tomorrow for seeing some strong to severe storms. But after that, most of my attention is going to go back to what's happening here. And I'll come back to that in just a few seconds here. But first, tomorrow on the 15th, we do see that the Storm Prediction Center is keeping a close eye, basically from just north of Memphis here, uh, all the way to this part of Ohio. That's going to be the area that has the best chance at seeing those nasty storms tomorrow. Strong to severe, capable of putting down some pretty heavy rainfall. And this is what the um, high-res NAM is calling for here as we go forward. Now, as we play this out, you can see through overnight tonight into tomorrow morning, just a lot of scattered precipitation in this area. And this is a region that's been very wet. You saw it a few moments ago. I mean, we're talking some places in here having a top 10 wettest uh, go of it so far in, in this month. But as we kind of play this forward, there we go, we'll notice that getting through the day on Friday into Friday afternoon and evening, right here is we're going to start to watch where some of that severe convection is show up. On the backside, this is all just light rain, but there'll be a frontal boundary that stretches all the way down to Texas. Take a look at that. Now, does it make it into the east? Well, this stuff does. It gets into the northeast after soaking this region through Saturday morning, but that front to the south just breaks up. See it? It's gone, and that's going to leave more dry days for the southeast. Now, the northeast, as it typically does, gathers all of this, and on the day on Saturday, we're going to have to watch for a line of storms to come through Virginia, come through North Carolina. Keep an eye on that right there. could extend into the northeast as well. But then after that, much of the country kind of gets a bit of a break. Certainly going to cool down 
okay, behind that front. But this is a nice view here Sunday morning. Uh, things are looking relatively dry. Now, the story beyond that is really told in the upper levels of the atmosphere, and that's what I want to get to here. So watch the uh, European operational run. Pull that trough by Saturday night all the way here over to the east. And behind it, we got the cooler air. But expect a rebound. See the ridge that's already there next Sunday getting into Monday? But as I mentioned a few moments ago, here along the west coast, in the Gulf of Alaska, in part of the Arctic, we've got this lined up with multiple troughs of low pressure. That's been the unshakable pattern we've had for a while. And I've attempted to forecast its breakdown, but I keep having to push it back, you know, a few more days, a few more days. I finally think we're there, that it's going to start to continue to move, because watch. Into Monday, we got a little system that's going to clip through Canada. And then we have this trough here that's going to come out in Wyoming right there on Tuesday. And then from Tuesday through Wednesday, that trough of low pressure is going to move to Wisconsin. So we're going to get some midweek next week, well, early week next week, rain right in through this area. And I'll show you that in a few moments. But look at the deep trough that's reloading in the Gulf of Alaska. And so while ridges keep building here, okay, in this near-term pattern, deep troughs of low pressure form here. And as you just get all the way out, watch what the European model does with this. Now I'm going to show you the model differences in a few seconds. But this would give us a screaming jet stream into the western United States. And that is the type that loads up from central and northern California, clear to Oregon and Washington, loads the mountains with some snow and puts down quite a bit of very heavy rainfall. Meanwhile, we've lost the, the, the bigger ridge feature that's kept the eastern half of the country so hot. So we're going to see some shifts in that. And I'll talk about those temperatures in a few moments. First, let's just stitch together all the precip that we're talking about, all right? You can see the three features we discussed. This is coming here in the next couple of days, and it gets into the northeast. Southeast is dry. Plains, southern plains, we're going to go over to a, a, a drier time period. Next Tuesday into Wednesday, we've got to watch this system. That's why you see some wetter conditions there. And then at the end of this time period, that's when the west is targeted with that strong, almost zonal, meaning west to east flow. Outside of that, there's a lot of folks that are going to get some drier days coming up here in the next 10 days. Now, I want to show you just how much water is in that system coming into California. So if you would, please keep your focus over here. This is precipitable water, and we're working our way through this weekend into early next week. Now, the next couple of waves, I mean, you can see it, right? They keep bringing in these tongues of very high precipitable water, but they don't really fully take aim on California until about the 20th. See that? Now watch what happens as we go from the 20th forward. We continue to see large pushes, especially after about the 22nd, 23rd, of very high precipitable water content air getting shoved into California. And that's why we see those big precip amounts in the ECMWF. Question is, does the GFS see the same thing? Well, we can ask and have a look. Combination of the European on the right, GFS on the left. And there's something weird about this. Are you ready? We've already looked out through Thursday today and into Friday, so we know what's coming through the eastern Corn Belt there. And then we get out here into Saturday. Both models open up the midsection of the country and have the next wave coming in the northwest. That's consistent. As we then play into Monday and Tuesday, take a look at this. By Tuesday morning, there's the wave in the European. That Remember what I was talking about coming out of Wyoming? Here it is in the GFS. As we play this forward, you know I always talk about how progressive the GFS is. In this case, the European brings in the deeper wave, and the GFS leaves a more open wave farther back. So now it looks as though the European has shoved this system farther to the east. And that comes sweeping through. The GFS later develops it. See it there? So by this is now this is 1 a.m. Central Time on Thursday next week. This is where the European has it, and the GFS is the system that's lingering. So that moves through, though. So that comes through the Great Lakes states. It comes in there in both models. This is mid to late week next week. Could drag a front through the lower Mississippi River Valley and try to bring some rain to the southeast, but not much. Now, out once we get past, oh, this is getting out in kind of no man's land with the models. But this is out here, 222-hour forecast, Saturday the 23rd. This is when the European is bringing in that targeted moisture out of the, the, the Gulf of Alaska and out of the North Pacific. GFS is later on it. So you see some of the differences there? So I, I wanted you to see that that's the, the main precipitation pattern as we move forward. I want to just bring your attention back, though, to this particular graphic. That's, that's the one that I kind of want to stay cemented in your head about this precip pattern uh, going forward here. 
Now, we talked a few moments ago about where things are going to go into week two. And remember, by day 10, this is the 24th, the GFS Ensemble was really now starting to bring in that trough. And you see that as we go forward, it leaves that long wave there and pushes the ridge a little bit farther to the east. Now, what the GFS Ensemble does with this is it eventually, now look, a little bit later, targets the west coast with the above normal precipitation in week two. But it also lets some of those waves eject into the plains, and that's why we see above normal precipitation here as well. It's not overly so, but it's not dry. So we got a dry next seven to 10 days coming up, and then when the pattern favors that deep west coast trough, things get active again. But that's, that's kind of typical of what fall can give us. Europeans bought into the same thing. That's just what I want to show you here. So Northern California, coastal Oregon, Washington, even the Columbia Basin, Snake River Valley. These are areas that once we get into week two, the likelihood of getting increased precipitation, it's really starting to show up. Now, when I see this, this goes all back to the end of October. It takes me back and ask, I have to ask myself, is this what the models forecast for October? And I gotta be honest, they did a pretty darn good job with this. Now remember, this was all early, early, early in the in the in the uh, last 30 days. Okay, uh, excuse me, early in the month of October. So that that's there. Um, I showed it to you earlier, right here. See how wet it was there? But I gotta look at this and say, oops, the European weeklies honestly are picking up on this pattern. I think pretty well. I mean, big systems coming through here into the Midwest, Eastern Corn Belt. We were a little drier at times here, but not as of late, thanks to Pamela coming through. That was the remnants of that hurricane that made it through here. Uh, but that's it. I, I gotta say the model found that pattern. Did it find the temperature pattern? Let's answer that question. Because from mid-September to mid-October, uh, parts of the Midwest, Upper Midwest, Great Lakes states in the Northeast, record heat. You can see it there, warmest on record for that 30 day time period, every place that you see the number one. What I've been trying to forecast is when is that going to go away? And I had mentioned that I thought once we got past the middle of the month, we had our best chances of this going away. Um, I was kind of right. Let me show what I'm talking about here. This is what the models forecast for that time period. Now, you got to say that the model did a pretty darn good job when looking a month ago at how well it was going to forecast this time period. It did a pretty good job with this. But where we're going right now, we do have freeze warnings out in this part of North Dakota, this part of uh, Colorado, and then coming down through the high plains here, even clipping some of our cotton belt. Still has some flood advisor, or excuse me, flood watches out here, but we got some cold air that's in place behind this. And I'm going to talk about that cold air first. So this next uh, few maps here are going to show you surface temperatures, uh, minimum temperatures, all right? And as we go from Thursday mornings, we already had these, into Friday morning, and then eventually into Saturday. Now, Saturday is when the coolest air really gets us its greatest extent. And if you look, you'll see this white line right here. See it? That is the 32 degree isotherm. So maybe around Lubbock, clipping the panhandles, high plains, back into Nebraska. This is where we could see an overnight low temperature that gets down to that frost point. Not in the east, not yet. It's still quite warm there in that warm sector of that cyclone. So this is Sunday. These are all lows getting into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Remember, you saw the ridge open back up there. What about the high temperatures? Well, we've already seen these today. There's Friday's high temperatures getting into Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I know we did that kind of fast, but I think you know what this pattern is going to look like. Day 5 through 10, let's just shrink that up so we can see it. Notice we just don't have the extent of the high temperatures in place anymore like we did. So, I mean, I'm not trying to say anything, but I, I guess we kind of saw this pattern break down a little bit, right? But with the ridges redeveloping, look at day 10 to 15. That's when we get this, that scream and flow into the west, and there was a ridge that started to move in this direction. It's not as hot as it has been, but it's at least something. Okay, looking at all of that, I want to ask myself one more question about the possibility of frost in the places that I haven't seen it yet. So I'm going to look at an animation here where the color shading, match it up here with the color bar on the bottom, the color shading tells you the probability of getting a temperature in the 30s. So it's below 40. That's what we're doing here. Now what you're going to notice is as I go through Saturday into Sunday, okay, from Sunday into Monday, we do get at high elevation the Appalachian Mountains. Those are going to be in the 40s there and here in the mountains in, in, in New England. But once we go beyond this, what I'm going to be looking for here, 
out past the 20th, 21st, there we go. Morning of the 21st, that's a pretty large area that could see low temperatures in the 30s here in the plains. And then as I get out there to the 22nd, the 23rd, I don't know, let's stop it there on the 23rd. Much of the northern part of the United States has got a chance at having lows uh, in the 30s. And I'm going to be watching the northeast especially once we get out there about the 24th. Uh, take a look at that. We got better than 50% chance of being with an overnight low in the 30s. Now the probability of a frost is still relatively low. See that? This is the probability of getting down to, to 32. But I just think toward the end of the month, we're going to have to start watching for more widespread risk on frost. But is the pattern going to stay favoring warmer conditions? And the longer range models are suggesting that they will. This is October 26th through November 25th. Brand new update from the ECMWF. Okay, teleconnections. We've talked about momentum. We know where all the greatest momentum is in the North uh, Pacific. Uh, MJO, like I talked about on Monday, collapsed into null space. Not a good predictor. It's going to pop out in phase one, two, but still I'm waiting for it to get higher amplitude before it becomes more of a factor. What this means is persistence is going to win in the models, and that's exactly what you got here. You're going to see the same thing on precipitation. Above normal in the west, active central plains in terms of storm track. And we're just going to have to keep an eye on that. That's the way things are kind of shaken down at this point as we look out there to October. So this means tighter harvest windows for folks that still need to finish. Okay, I'll stop there. Hope you all have a good rest of your week and weekend, and we will talk again on Monday. Thank you.